Welcome to the River Online Sermon. Thank you for joining with me today. It's the week after Easter, and we are um, looking forward to continuing to uh, seek the Lord together as a church as we have our seven minutes, um, seven times a day prayer time. And um, I just want to encourage you to keep praying. Um, we're praying for God to be at work in our lives and in the li life of our church and our homes and all of that to accomplish whatever it is that he wants to accomplish that we might grow in him. And uh, so let me pray for our time together. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this time. I thank you for um, just how good it is to know you. Lord, I pray that you would be with us, each one of us individually. I pray for everybody who is listening to this sermon, for our church as a whole, for each one of us as individuals and collectively as a church and as families. Lord, that you would work in our lives to accomplish whatever it is that you want to accomplish. You would help us to be open to what it is that you want to do in us to be responding, to be learning, to be growing. Um, may you be at work. May you bring to light all the things that need to be brought to light. May you um, deal with whatever needs to be dealt with. May you remove whatever barriers in the way for, for your will to be accomplished, um, both in our lives, in our homes, in our church. Um, may your kingdom come and your will be done. May you be glorified. And I pray specifically for this time, for the sermon, that you would guide and direct me as I teach and all of us as we hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you know where the word Christian comes from and what it means? So in Acts 11.26, we find out that the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. And the, the word, the Greek word that is used there is Christianos. And it refers to a follower of Christ, but combines the word for Christ with, uh, which means like anointed one or, or uh, the, like it's talking about the Messiah. Um, and it combines that with a suffix that um, some believe refers to more of like a diminutive form. Um, so like it would be saying like little Christ or little anointed ones. Um, while others believe that it, it means more along the lines of belonging to uh, or like an adherent of, like, like they belong to the anointed one or something like that. Now, it's important to recognize that the term Christian was not a term or a word that the, the early believers used to identify themselves. It was something that was given to them. Some um, other people, Gentiles, people who were outsiders, um, called them this. Uh, some scholars believe that the, the term at first was actually meant to be derogatory. Uh, and we don't know for sure if that's the case or not, but regardless of the intent of the name, the name stuck. And the followers of Christ came to be known as Christians. Now, do you like the term Christian? Do you like being called that? Well, today in our society, the term itself seems to carry, come with a lot of baggage. Many people hear it and cringe or are turned off by it. But then what name would you prefer? Well, in the Bible, we tend to see believers often referred to by uh, the word saints. It's uh, the Greek word hagios, which means consecrated or set apart or dedicated. And it's kind of a cool um, word to be used, uh, but we typically tend to use it for only like extra special Christians, right? Like those saints. And uh, we kind of feel a little bit timid about using it for ourselves. So what word would work? Maybe Christ follower, believer, Jesus freak? I don't know. Whatever name you prefer, today we're going to take a, a look. We're going to begin a new series where we're going to talk about what it looks like to be a Christian or a Christ follower, a believer, whatever um, term somebody might use to describe us. What does that mean? What does it look like? Well, please turn with me in your Bibles to uh, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4. Now, this sermon series is entitled Follow Me, and I think you're going to see as we go through why it's called that, and as we just kind of begin with, with what it means, like what kind of even describing a little bit what, what exactly even is a Christian or a Christ follower. Now, first, let's begin with a little bit of context. This passage takes place very early in Jesus's ministry, and his baptism and temptation have happened, and, and he has begun some of his earthly ministry. But most of the stories that we know, most of the things that we um, are familiar with about Jesus's ministry as we read about them through the Gospels, those haven't happened yet. So keep that in mind as we take a look at our passage for today, picking things up with verse 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, 
for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So, before we get into Jesus' call on their lives, let's dig into the particulars of the people, um, as well as setting and whatever else that comes up. But let's, let's first talk about these four guys. There's these four men who are mentioned by name, Simon, Andrew, James, and John. What do you know about those guys? So Simon is most often referred to as Peter in, in the Bible for us, um, which we see there in verse 18. Simon would be his given Jewish name. In John 1, Jesus then says that he will be called Cephas, which is Aramaic for rock or stone. Petros would then be the Greek version of that. And then English would be the English, or, and then in English it would be um, the name Peter, right? So in scripture, we sometimes see him referred to as Simon, sometimes as Simon Peter or just Peter or Cephas or whatever combination. Um, but regardless of what name is being used for him, Peter is definitely more talked about in scripture than his brother Andrew, right? Andrew is only mentioned uh, 12 times in the Bible, and almost all of those times it's either as part of a list of disciples um, or specifically in reference to him being Peter's brother. Now, there are other disciples who are mentioned even less than Andrew, like Thaddeus, who's only mentioned twice, and both times is just part of a list. But Andrew's name um, does come up less than Peter as well as James and John. Actually, those three, Peter, James, and John, are probably the most famous of all the disciples. Maybe Judas, but Judas is more infamous than famous. But these three were the ones who made up Jesus' inner circle, the, the ones who had extra access to Christ and who seem more involved or at least mentioned more often in the Gospels as being part of the stories that happen with Jesus. And Andrew might very well have been there for many things, but he oftentimes wasn't really mentioned. Now, basically, this is simply two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew, James and John, and they were all fishermen. Now, that's not a surprise because they're by the Sea of Galilee, which is a large body of water, about 13 uh, miles long and nine miles wide, sometimes referred to as Lake Gennesaret, but where fishing would have been a very popular profession, right? And actually, the way it's worded here with James and John fishing with their dad, as well as what we find in parallel passages like in Mark, where it mentions hired servants, or in Luke, where it seems to suggest that, that Jesus gets into the boat that Peter maybe owned, um, or um, where it also mentions that, that um, James and John were partners with Simon. Now, putting all of that together, it, it seems to suggest that they were not just like fishermen, not just like hired guys, but more likely owners in a fishing business, or at least family, part of a family business or something. And at this point, they were actively working, or maybe just recently finished working. Uh, it says that they're like um, some of them were casting nets, some of them were mending nets. The idea of mending nets would have probably not been like mending them before they went out, but mending them after they'd come back in, like after a night of fishing. So it's like Jesus is kind of interrupting them as they're working, showing up at their place of business, and specifically calling them to leave that business behind to follow him. Now, before we talk about the calling itself, let's first talk about the response. Um, what do you think of this response to Jesus' calling of them? So it's immediate, right? They don't hesitate. It's not like they are like, well, wait a second. We need to take some time to pray. Maybe talk about it with a loved one, something like that. It just suggests that they were convinced that it was worth it for them to give up what they had to go and follow Jesus. He was, after all, calling them to leave behind his their fishing business. Um, Zebedee was still going to be there. Zebedee's the dad, right, for James and John. Um, He's still going to be there, and along with hired guys, as we find from other places. But these four guys were walking away from the fishing business. Now, it's also interesting to note that it seems like Jesus was calling specifically these four, right? I mean, it sounds like there were other people. At least Zebedee was there and possibly others. And yet, it's like Jesus specifically singled them out, Peter, James, Andrew, and John. Now, I love the way that Jesus specifically ties in their profession Right? It's kind of cool how, how he says that from now on, rather than catching fish, you're going to be catching men. Um, something maybe they didn't fully understand when he told them. But we know as we see Jesus' ongoing ministry and eventually the great commission he gives to them at the end, that that's the whole purpose, that they're going to be going out and sharing the gospel, fishing for men, like trying to reach men with this gospel message, reach people with the gospel message, not just, not just fish. It's like he's calling them to this, this other role. But 
getting back to the calling itself, I want to point out that if we look at the other Gospels, we find that there's some there's several other um, like calling of the disciples that happens in different passages. And I want to make sure to point those out so that we get the whole picture before jumping to conclusions about what's happening at this moment. You see, if all we do is read this story by itself, it seems like the fishermen have no frame of reference for Jesus. He just shows up out of the blue and says, follow me, and they drop everything and follow him. Now, what would you think of that? If that was the case, what would you think of that? It'd be pretty radical, right? Faith-filled, yes, but kind of blind faith-filled. Like, who is Jesus? They didn't do any research. They just drop everything and follow him. But is that really the case? Is that really what's happening? So let me point out a few other interesting passages. So it's not like Matthew doesn't really get into this before this part, but there's other places, other authors have talked about some things that I think are good for us to notice. So first of all, in John chapter 1, we find John the Baptist hanging out with a couple of his own disciples. So some of some disciples of John the Baptist, two guys. And Jesus walks by and John says to them, behold the Lamb of God. The two guys then leave John and they go and follow Jesus. Now we find out later in that story that one of the guys, one of the two guys that did that was Andrew. And it also is, seems to, the way it's written, it seems to suggest that the other guy was John. So here we have two of the four guys mentioned in our story for today. Now think about that. Um, the, the, in the John the Baptist, or in the, in the passage in John, um, these guys were disciples first of John the Baptist. We don't know how long they were disciples of John the Baptist, but at least it seems to suggest they were disciples. So they have heard what John was talking about. They knew that they would have known, like his message was all about preparing the way for Jesus. So they would have heard about the Messiah and would have seen um, John talking about him and, and heard what he had to say. And then when, when John points out, this is the Lamb of God, you can see how that's that's helping them to understand who Jesus is, providing a frame of reference for that. And then Jesus invites them to come and know him, it says in that story. And, and they kind of, it's like they go and they kind of get to know him a little bit. And in that story, we find out that Andrew went and found his brother, Simon Peter, and told him that they had found the Messiah and brought him along. Now, James is not mentioned, but it would not be a surprise that if it truly was Andrew and John, that John also would have done the same and brought his brother, especially since we've seen them kind of being close later on. Maybe all four of them um, were, were there initially kind of uh, jumping in to, to follow Jesus and believing that he is the Messiah. The story then goes on to speak of the calling of Philip and, and Nathaniel as well. And then that leads into the story of the wedding at Cana, where Jesus turned water into wine. And it mentions that um, Jesus was there at that moment with his disciples. Um, so that's in John 1, the call, some of this calling of the disciples. Then there's a really interesting passage in Luke 5, where we find Jesus preaching along the, the shore, and the crowd was so thick that Jesus actually got into a boat, apparently belonging to, or at least run by, Peter, um, and has him push away from the, the shore a little bit. And then Jesus preaches from that boat with Simon probably right there, and he preaches to the crowd. Um, and then he tells Simon to push out even a little farther and to let out his nets, and we have the miraculous catch of fish, where there's so many fish that they can't even haul them in and everything. And Simon responds by falling down to Jesus' knees and confessing that he is a sinful man and calling Jesus Lord. It says also that James and John were present at that moment. And it leads to then Jesus inviting them to come and follow him. And then later on in Matthew 10 and Mark 3 and Luke 6, um, we eventually find Jesus specifically um, gathering together a lot of his followers. And he specifically appoints 12 to be his disciples. Now, the wording suggests that there were other guys there. There were other people there who followed as well, but only the 12 were chosen and singled out to be his disciples. So the question becomes, what was the order of events? And like, how did these things take place? Which passage comes first and so on? How are they intertwined with one another? 
Now, to me, as I read this and start to try to figure out how it all works together, a timeline, a timeline of events that seems to make the most sense to me based on how I read this is that the John passage happens first. Makes sense that Andrew and, and John, possibly, were disciples of John the Baptist. And after hearing what John said and all the things he taught about the Messiah and, and preparing the way, and then saying Jesus is the Lamb of God, it makes sense that they then leave the preparer, the one who prepared the way, to follow the way, to follow Jesus. And then it also makes sense to me that they brought along P Peter and possibly James as well at that moment. And there were others as well. And they at least to some extent followed Jesus or, during that time frame and are there probably for the wedding of Cana um, and possible other moments, hearing him teach, seeing what he's doing. Um, but And I think part of the reason I, I think that is that we then find in Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, so right before our passage for today, we find a verse where it suggests that after John was arrested, Jesus withdrew to Galilee and then that leads into the calling passage that we looked at just a moment ago, these four guys. Um, so my thinking is that before his encounter, um, before this encounter that we looked at this morning, that at the very least, Andrew and, and probably John um, and Peter, possibly James, had already been following, well, two of them had already been following John the Baptist and heard all that he said, and then tie that into all of them going and getting to know Jesus, spending some time hearing his teaching, seeing his miracles, communicating with him one-on-one, -on -one, getting to know him, following him to some extent. We don't know how long, how far, what exactly was happening, but at least to some extent. And then after arriving back in Galilee, so after after John's arrest, Jesus and, and his disciples head back to Galilee. And after arriving back to Galilee, they go back to fishing. They, it's not necessarily that they stopped following Jesus completely or that they distanced himself, that they didn't believe in him anymore or anything like that. They just went back to their lives. And, it, and then I think we then arrive at this passage and possibly the miraculous catch of fish intertwined with this passage, which seems also to make sense to me, um, where all of that is happening, Jesus teaching, maybe being in, in um, Peter's boat, and then eventually all of this other stuff, um, and then arriving at this passage, where which would mean that when we get here, when they, when it seems like they immediately drop everything to follow him, it's not like they have never heard of this guy before. They've already heard John the Baptist's testimony of who he is. They've heard from Jesus himself. They've gotten to know him. They've heard his teachings, seen his miracles, understood who he is. Um, and then they make the realization that, yes, we're willing to leave this fishing business, leave all of this stuff behind so that we can follow him. That makes sense to me. I, I can kind of see that. And then I also think that we then, if you kind of go on through the rest of Scripture, you also see Matthew's calling, which happens elsewhere. And um, and then there's also probably other callings of where, where Jesus called other people to follow him and then are not recorded for us specifically in the Gospels, people who are never even named. And, and, and then Jesus gathers these people together, many of whom we never hear about in the Gospels specifically, but these people who are following Jesus. And he, out of those guys, specifically appoints 12, of which these four are part of that, that 12. And he calls them once again to an even greater, deeper, more intense following. So all of this makes sense to me. It, it helps me to maybe understand um, not just how things took place and why they do what they do here, but to maybe understand a little bit better about what it actually looks like to be a follower of Christ. With all that in mind then, I'm going to close our t time together by simply asking, what does it mean when Jesus says, follow me? What was he calling them to do or to be? What's, what does that mean to follow him? Well, I think that the invitation to follow Christ is both simple and profoundly complex. It's simple because he's inviting us to come and to get to know him. He's revealing himself to us, inviting us to a relationship with him as our Savior. Simple, right? Come to Jesus. Um, but it doesn't stop there. Now, we've talked in the past about how our society many times 
has kind of made it as if the idea of being Christian is more of a transaction that happens. Pray this prayer, receive this gift of grace, get into heaven, so on and so forth. But Jesus is actually inviting us more on a journey, a journey that begins with the words, follow me. And then it's not just the, it's not just you get on this journey and then everything's fine. It's over and over again throughout the journey, there are moments when Jesus invites us to go deeper. He once again invites us to follow him. It's an it's an ongoing, unending invitation. It's The initial invitation is to follow Christ, to get to know him, to accept him as our Savior. Then as we grow in our understanding of who he is, there's an, there's an, uh, 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 an ongoing calling to know him at a deeper level. Not only as Savior, but as Lord. And, and then he calls us to leave other things behind for a closer walk with him, like the fishing business. And uh, there's a calling for him to, to take his rightful place on the throne of our lives, a calling to... to um, let him work in us to do things that we could never do in ourselves, a, a calling to join him in this mission that he has for the whole world, to know him, uh, to, to, to inviting us to be fishers of men, if you will. It's ongoing. It's, it's profoundly complex. Did you know that Jesus not only invited Peter to follow him here at the beginning of his ministry, but also at the end, after his resurrection, Jesus took the time to meet specifically with Peter, who had denied Jesus before his death. And as he reinstated Peter, he once again uses the same words, inviting Peter to follow him. Follow me. That phrase, follow me, is, is simple and profoundly complex. It's not a calling to a transaction. It's calling to a lifelong journey. And that calling is repeated over and over again so that the journey grows deeper and more full. So the phrase, follow me, is applicable to those who have not yet responded to Christ's initial calling, who have never spent any time in relationship with him. But it's also applicable for those who have followed Christ their whole lives, as Christ invites us further on this journey. So for me, regardless of what term is used, or what name is given, Christian, saint, Christ follower, believer. What matters is are we responding to that simple yet complex, profoundly complex invitation? Are we following him? Over the next several weeks, we're going to dig into what that means. What does it look like for us to follow him? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this time. I thank you for your word, may you help us to understand more and more of what this means for us and to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.